this event, and we have an event on the 18th as well. These events are so important today so that there's not a repeat of what has happened. We don't want to have this ever happen again. It shows uh, the dangers of anti-Semitism and intolerance and any kind of hatred. I'm a member of the Center for Peace, Justice, and Reconciliation, and we try to sponsor events like this throughout the semester. My colleague, Never, could you please stand? Also, she scheduled some uh, excellent Armenian programs as well. And I want to thank Ann Mangazzini, <coughs> Professor Ann Mangazzini. She has brought this program today. So without further ado, oh, I also want to thank the Office of Student Affairs. They've provided the refreshments in the back, so that you're not totally starved, you can at least focus on the speaker. And uh, uh, other members of the team are currently not here because they're teaching. Uh, I want to recognize uh, the members, uh, Tom LaPointe, Sarah Schertz, Christina Hito, David Eichenholz. <coughs> oh, Ellen Five. Okay, so that's the members of our team. So without further ado, I want to introduce Ann Magazine. Welcome. Uh, certainly this is uh, an opportune time for you in this uh, Passover week. And of course, April is Holocaust Remembrance Month. Um, as Beverly mentioned, my name is Ann Magazzini. I teach psychology courses here at the college. Um, and I actually applied for a grant from the Center for Peace, Justice, and Reconciliation um, called Following in Milgram's Footsteps. He did a very famous study on obedience to authority, which he got the idea from. Uh, the Holocaust, uh, which was the triggering moment. So I do want to thank the Center for Peace, Justice, and Reconciliation uh, for giving me the grant. We did, I did a lecture about his work uh, two weeks ago, and I'm very happy to be presenting uh, Maud Dami today as our keynote speaker for Holocaust Remembrance Month. I met Maud last summer um, when she led a tour of 37 educators through Germany, the Czech Republic, uh, Poland and the Netherlands, um, and the trip was sponsored by the New Jersey Commission on the Holocaust and Genocide Studies and also uh, supported by the New Jersey Education Association. Um, as you may be aware, Holocaust uh, and Genocide Studies are a part of the state curriculum in New Jersey, and so this was a, a wonderful experience in terms of learning a great deal um, about the Holocaust. And then these teachers go back and share it with their students in the classroom. So, uh, Maud Dami, uh, just get a little bit of background about her. Uh, she's past president of the New Jersey State Board of Education, a nationally respected leader in the field of education. In addition to the state board, on which she served from 1983 to 2007, uh, Maud was also for many years a member of the Interstate Migrant Education Council, and she chaired that uh, council from in 1998 and in 2007. Um, in 1995, she also served as president of the National Association of State Boards of Education. Her involvement in local and educational affairs is all the more remarkable given the fact that Maud Dami is a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, she's a passionate advocate of Holocaust education, has been a member of the New Jersey Commission on the Holocaust and Genocide Studies since 1982, which was its inception. She was appointed by then Governor Thomas Kane uh, to that commission, and she has been on it since then and was just reappointed this past summer uh, for another three-year term. Um, as with most child survivors of the Holocaust, Maud found it difficult to speak about her years as a hidden child, however, since the mid-1980s, she has overcome her inhibitions and been a frequent speaker, uh, especially to school children. So, uh, in 2014, Maud was inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame as one of the state's unsung heroes. 
so I'm not doing something more. All right, so. And in, 19, in 2015, she actually published her own memoir called Chocolate, The Taste of Freedom, um, which chronicles uh, both her wartime experiences and then her post-war experiences. And I'll just quote from Governor Thomas Kane what he said about the book. This is, this is a story of a terrible evil and of those who at risk of their own lives decided that evil must not triumph. It is a story of endurance and hope it is a story of a gentle and courageous woman who emerged from the desperation of the European Holocaust to become a leader in her community and in the new world. Uh, and her memoir uh, is a story of courage, hope, and bravery and will inspire generations of young and old. And as I said, she will no longer be an unsung hero. More Dami. Thank you. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon now. Yes, yes. I'm just delighted to be here today and to share with you my story as I was a hidden child during three years of the Holocaust in the Netherlands. But before I say anything, I just would like, and as uh, was said earlier, I started talking about it. I've been in this country since 1950, but I never spoke about it. So this is what prompted me to start to speak about who I am and what happened. Now you all watch 60 Minutes and you know they have a story in one and then the following week they show you parts of a letter that people have written in on the previous week's story, whatever it was. And it appeared a week, this, part of this letter appeared a week after they had done a story on Raul Romberg who um, saved many, many Hungarian Jews. And I have been I had watched that, and the following week I was watching 60 Minutes, and this is what appeared on the screen after the week after the story about Raoul Romberg, and I'll quote, the Jews of Europe were not exterminated in gas chambers. The gas chambers were wartime propaganda fantasies. When I saw that, I knew that I had to speak, and the worst of it was this was somebody I happened to know who wrote this. So that's prompted me to start to speak. But I think other things led to it too, and I thought maybe I would read you this. Um, and it was written by uh, Robert Krell, I believe he's a Canadian physician. And it says, facing memories, silent, no more. Years of life beyond almost certain death, who would have thought that we would live to see this day given such overwhelming odds? For most of those years, child survivors lived in silence. Silence served us well, especially while hiding, because survival so often depended on not being noticed, being inconspicuous, and on the ability to suppress tears and ignore pain. Grief was born in silence. So was rage. Silence is the language of the child survivor. We might have talked after the war, but adults persuaded us, get on with life, forget the past. Adults who themselves survived and suffered so much inadvertently diminished the experiences of the children. In the aftermath of that silence, which involved our existent, existence, what needed saying was no, not said. So after I read both of these, I decided that I had to start to speak about who I am. I uh, learned to speak English pretty well, even though I didn't speak a word. But um, no one really asked, where are you from? I just assumed I was born and raised here. So I started speaking, because I felt it was so important to have to share. Because when you see something that was written on a program on CBS, I knew we had to speak up. Well, my story begins in the Netherlands, and I lived there with my mother and my father, and I have a sister who's two years younger than I. My mother had come from Germany. She um, had come to the Netherlands for a party or something, and she met my father, and they fell in love, and they got married, and she became a Dutch citizen. My father worked for his father. Um, my Dutch grandfather had a uh, restaurant at the train station. My hometown was Amersfoort. He had a, a restaurant there, and he also had a kiosk, but not like you all know kiosk. A kiosk in the Netherlands is more like a newspaper stand. 
and he had these, I, just, I knew he had it in my hometown, and I just recently found out that he had these kiosks in many, many train stations all through the Netherlands. My dad learned to be a chef so that he could work for his father, and um, my German grandparents, my mother's parents, still lived in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, where my grandfather was the cantor at the synagogue there. But as we, you know, Hitler rose to power, and especially in Germany, all sorts of regulations came out and things were happening to the Jewish population. Many of them left, and many had friends in other countries and went relatives or friends, but many also came to the Netherlands, and they knew no one. And the Dutch government really didn't know what to do with this influx of German Jewish refugees, so they took a piece of land and build them like barracks and a whole section. And it became a whole community because among the people were physicians, so they had a little hospital, and they had teachers. They were able to teach the children because these people had nothing. They had just the clothes on their backs and maybe one suitcase or something that they escaped and came to the Netherlands, thinking they would be safe in the Netherlands. The Netherlands had remained neutral in the First World War and was going to be neutral again in the Second World War. But the more my parents started to hear what was happening in Germany, they decided it was best for my German grandparents to leave everything behind and come and live with us. Because as I said, they would be safe. So my dad took the train, brought them back to live with us. I had, I, at that time, I was in 1940, when we woke up, I, I, one morning, I was four years old. And we woke up one morning and Hitler invaded the Netherlands. He invaded the Low Countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. We were totally unprepared for this. We wake up and there's planes overhead, soldiers parachuting down, tanks and soldiers marching into the country. And, and the Dutch were just totally unprepared. Now my hometown is also a military town, so there were a lot of military bases all around, and I recently found out, which I didn't know either, was that they evacuated my whole town, all the citizens and animals, because of all the military bases with Dutch soldiers and the Germans, so they thought of all the fighting that was going to happen. Well, there was some fighting, yes. On the fifth day of that invasion into our country, well, my former country, it, um, Hitler came in and bombed our biggest port city of Rotterdam. Thousands of people died. And Hitler said to the Dutch, if you do not surrender now, I'm going to bomb every city in the Netherlands. And the Dutch surrendered. There was nothing else they could do. <coughs> the Netherlands is a monarchy. Queen Wilhelmina left the country and set up a government in exile in England. And Hitler, as he did in most countries, he selected someone to be the commandant of the Netherlands, and he selected a person called Dr. Arthur Seiss Inquart, who now became the commissioner or the head of the Dutch. Now, there were many Dutch Nazis also in the Netherlands, as there were in many <coughs> other countries also. So he had some help in establish a whole train of government. It be started to become very, very difficult for us now because the same thing that had been happening in other countries that had been taken over by Hitler, it's now started to happen to us. Every Jew had to register. Well, who would have known what the end would be? So everyone registered. So the next thing was more restrictions started to come. Um, Jews can't have a car, took away our car. They had, my grandfather had to take a, a Nazi into the business so he could be watched. And it, it just continued. All of a sudden, all the freedoms that we had as Dutch citizens, just like everyone else, suddenly was taken away from us. My mother couldn't even go to, well, we didn't have supermarkets then, but like to the vegetable market or the butcher. These are the days Jewish housewives may go, and these are the hours they may go. So all of a sudden, our life started to be more and more and more restricted. Jews can use public transportation. Now, I was very excited because in the summer of 1941, I started school. I was going to kindergarten, and I was very excited to go. And it was a public school that was like over on the next street. And But then another regulation came out. No Jewish child can attend public school. 
we had to, and of course my town, we didn't have uh, a, a school for just Jewish children. So some of the parents and all the Jewish teachers were fired, all the principals, superintendents, anyone who was Jewish was out of the public education system. They had already fired everyone who worked for the government in some capacity, whether it was the town, the township, the city, the federal government. If you were Jewish, you were out, no job. So I, I was very upset, but fortunately, some of the mothers and Jewish teachers got together, rented some rooms, and tried to continue our education as best as they could. My parents were summoned to the synagogue. We have one synagogue in my town, and on a Sunday afternoon, and the rabbi read a letter to the <coughs> congregation, and the letter was from the German command. And they said, we have wonderful news for you. We are going to have trains at the train station on this particular day, at, and the trains will leave at this hour, and we, these trains are going east to take you away from the war scene because there was already bombing. The Allies came in, and especially since my town was a military town, all the bases were occupied by German soldiers. It's a, the town is like in the middle of the country. The train station was very important because the went, trains went in every direction. So the, it'll be wonderful. It'll take you away from the bombing. The children can continue their education, and the parents can... Well, it's mostly men that work then, that, that can get jobs. And everybody's going like, well, where are these trains? Where are they going? No answer to that. So on the way home, my parents snuck into a Christian friend's house. Oh, we're not allowed to associate with our Christian friends. They were not allowed to come visit us. We were not allowed to go see them. So they snuck into this man's house. His name was uh, Case Ronswell. He was a business associate. And my parents, because they thought they had to ask somebody. So my mother happened to look on his desk. And on his desk, she saw that same letter that had just been read in the synagogue. She think, oh, why does he have this letter? How? And she thought it could only be one of two things. He either was a Dutch Nazi, or he was working for the resistance, the underground. So she got up enough nerve and said, Case, how come you, you have this letter? And he said, I'll tell you. He said, I'm working for the resistance. And we were able to secure a copy of this letter. And my parents said, well, what should we do? And he said, well, he said, we have been going all over the country, all over the Netherlands, asking Christian families if the need should arise, would you hide Jewish children, take them in and hide them? And he said, I have a family that's willing to take your two daughters. I was six and a half, my sister was four and a half. He said to my parents, I can't tell you who they are, I can't tell you where they live, no information as to where we were going to be. I think the only thing he mentioned was that they were farmers. And he said, I have to know by tomorrow morning. So my parents went home, and I can imagine as a parent myself, if I could do this to give up my children, knowing I may never ever see them again. But they, for the love of us, they decided yes. And I remember my parents telling my sister and I, we've got wonderful news for you. You're going on a vacation to a farm. We lived in the city, so that was great. We were very excited to go to a farm. And while well, you're on the farm for a couple of weeks, we're going on our vacation, and then we'll come and pick you up. So we were very happy. And I remember my mother packing a little suitcase for us. And I remember that day. Because my father was told where to bring us. It was a house in the neighborhood. And I remember I had a tricycle, so did my sister. We were riding that there. And my father left us at the garden gate to this house and said, take very good care of your sister. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. So we went in. Unfortunately, you know, now I have some questions, but there's no one alive to answer my questions. I don't know what we were told why we were going to that house, I don't know. But we went in and it was a lovely family. We had dinner with them. They put us to bed there. And I remember them waking us up about two or three in the morning and saying, hurry up, hurry up, get dressed. We're leaving. And this is what had to happen. This man, his name is Jan Kanis. He's also being recognized at a righteous at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. He was the one that was going to take us to this family. But we couldn't leave from my hometown because of the two businesses at the train station. Everybody knew my sister and I. So they thought it was best 
if we walk through the woods at night and go to the next town and take a train there and nobody would know us. The other thing was, I, since I was over six years old, I was already wearing that star, and inside that's the Dutch word for Jew. Anyone who was six years old had to wear this star at all times when you go outside. Well, I was very excited being six years old and being all grown up to wear a star, like all the big people. And my sister was only four, and my mother was so happy she didn't have to wear this star. But I guess from what I've heard, she pulled all sorts of temper tantrums, and I don't know what she did. My mother sewed one on her jacket. So that day, Mr. Akanis took us to the place where we were going to hide. We didn't have the stars on anymore, obviously, because we were not allowed to be on the train. So he took us, and we indeed were at a farm. And it's in part of the Netherlands that of the farms, there was like, then it was the, the highway. And then they had um, farms were on both sides with all the fields and back of the farms. And he left us there. And I remember the very first evening, it was a couple that were in their 60s, had no children, but all the farmers there were very, very religious and very, very poor. And I remember that very first evening, some of their relatives came over, I guess, to meet my sister and I. And I remember, because I felt like I was so grown up, I'm telling them, you know, I'm all grown up because I wear a star, but I'm not wearing it. Oh, and, and I started school, and I know how to spell my name and write my name. That's all I remember. I don't know what else was said. And so I guess their, their friends or relatives left, and this couple sat me down. I'm six and a half years old, and told me why I was really there. This was not a vacation. And they said, we're going to tell you something, and you must remember this. No matter who approaches you and wants to know who you are, because this is what you have to say. You are supposed to be our nieces who were bombed out of one of the cities. So many people were homeless, and people were taken in total strangers. So, and we came from a city. We did not speak their dialect. So you were bombed out of a city. You are our nieces, so you have to call us aunt and uncle. And in Dutch, uncle is om and aunt is tante, but my sister couldn't quite pronounce tante, so she called her tiny. And you cannot go to school here because we're afraid if you go to school, you might say something to a classmate, and they may go home and say something, whatever I've said, to their parents who may be Dutch Nazis. Everybody who was hiding Jews, if Jews were caught in their house or on their property, the people would be taken too. So they wanted to make sure that I knew this story. It was very hard for me because now I knew, I don't think I fully understood. I remembered and I could not go outside until I remembered now who I am. Also, they said, since you are nieces, you will have our last name. And their last name was Spronk. And my first name in Dutch, it's Maud, but in Dutch it's pronounced Maud they change it to Margie or Margie. So now I'm Margie Spronk. My sister is, was Rita, she became Rika Spronk. Of course she was, had no idea, so, but I had that burden. Now I knew, and they said, you must remember, if you do not remember when anyone approaches you, and, and you have to understand, the country was occupied, there were, all the traffic were German trucks, there were big guns set up on the farm because they were shooting at the Allied planes, there were soldiers walking all around all the time. So you just have to remember. So you have to stay in the house until you remember this. So after a while, we were allowed to go out, but we went with aunt and uncle and worked the fields. And it was very scary. Um, we went to church every Sunday. Every night, I prayed that I would live another day. I'm only six and a half years old. One day, they sent my sister and I we went to visit another relative, and we came back, and they knew they had done something on the farm. So I, I guess I must have been maybe seven and a half. I was very inquisitive. I kept asking. So at dusk, they took me outside, and they took me to one of the barns, and that barn had like uh, an extended roof, and underneath we had all our firewood. There was no gas or electric. There was no running water. So all our firewood was there, and also, Aunt, or Tony's brother, also lived with us, and he was a wooden shoemaker. 
and he had a lot of wasted wood too, so that was all there. So they took me to this area, and they looked, because it's all open, there was nobody around, and they cleared away the wood, and there was a trap door, and they opened the trap door, and there was a young Jewish boy hiding there. No idea where he came from. I learned his story after the war. He lived in Amsterdam with his family, and the Nazis had razzias, which were roundups, and they, and that usually happens in the middle of the night, and they were in their apartment. His mother and his two little brothers, his father and his older brother had already been taken because they were taking most of the young men also all for labor in Germany. And they heard, they woke up and they heard this truck and looked out the apartment window and sure enough there was a truck, German soldiers jumping out. They knew they were going to come and get them. So he said to his mother, you know, he knew, I don't know how, but he knew some way of getting into the apartment next door. He said, it's empty. Why don't we go and hide there? They'll come in, they'll break down the door, they'll find nobody, they'll leave. So there was some way he could access it through attics, I think. So his mother said, no, I don't want to do that. You want to do it, you go ahead. So he did. His mother and brothers were taken. So he hid out in that apartment the next day. He snuck back into his own apartment and he packed a few things and knew exactly where he was going to go. Because years before, as a city boy, he had had the opportunity to spend, what was it, the Fresh Air Fund, here where children have an opportunity to spend some time in the country. He had done that maybe years before when he was a lot, he's now 17, he was a lot younger. And he had been on the farm where we were now hiding. And he had kind of kept in contact with aunt and my new aunt and uncle. So he knew if he could get there, they would hide him. So he took off his star and on his way out of Amsterdam, he stopped by, there was a theater in Amsterdam where they was like a holding place for Jews before they were being sent to the transit camps. And he went over there just as he approached, he saw his little brothers being taken outside. And he goes, psst, psst, come with me, come with me. And they said, no, we want to stay with mommy. So he had to leave them behind. They all perished. But, and he did somehow magically got to the farm. I never saw him. He was sleeping at night in the meadows or in, in um, hay stacks, wherever he could find a place. And, but while he was still around, he found out one of his friends was being hidden on one of the neighboring farms, one of his friends from Amsterdam. So he decided he's going to go visit his friend. So he took the bicycle. And he took the bicycle of Tiny or Aunt's brother, the wooden shoemaker, but he couldn't hear. Barely he could hear, he really couldn't speak. So he took that bicycle, and on the back it had, you know, like here when you're disabled, you have the handicapped sign in your car rear view mirror hanging. Here was a little thing on the back of the bike. And he's pedaling down the highway, and he got stopped by German soldiers. So he pretended that he couldn't speak, that he couldn't hear, and he's like, and he knew very well they were looking for his ID, which he didn't have. So finally they got disgusted with him, they let him go. So that's when they decided they really could not have him about that much anymore, they had to really hide him. And that's when they decided to hide him um, in this barn. And they said to me, now once a day, we want you to bring him something to eat. But you have to be very careful, because it's all open, that nobody sees you. Everything was fine until one day I had gone down, they had made like some wooden steps down, and he had like, a couple of them, like a straw mattress and candles. And I was coming back up with the empty pot, and there were half a dozen German soldiers just standing there. I mean, it was so obvious, a little girl coming out of a trap door and coming out of the ground. I didn't know what to do, because I knew I was going to be killed right then and there. But I guess, being only maybe seven and a half, I just pretended they weren't there. So I busied myself, I put the trap door down, covered the wood, and they just stood there and watched me. And I knew I had to turn my back and walk away and pray because I knew I was going to be shot. But nothing happened. They turned around and walked away. Because when I got into the farmhouse, I was hysterical, and they said, well, they're going to tell a superior officer, no, we're not going to come back and get him and get all of us. No one ever came back. 
And it took me, you know, and I, I was so worried because the rest of, of those years I was so scared because if they would come, it was going to be my fault. I didn't quite understand. I remember being at night being so afraid that they were going to come and take us away, but nobody did. And I think they just, um, even among, among all this evil that existed, these were soldiers that had been drafted in the army, I guess, and never told anyone. And so there was even some goodness among all this evil that they did not come back to get us. And it became more and more difficult. There was no food, though we were fortunate being on the farm. I remember and people from the cities would travel, especially in the winter, um, to farms to try and beg for some food. And I know many times in the morning I'd walk out the farm outside, people had arrived during the night, which we didn't know, and I just froze them to death. So it was, it was just a horrible, horrible time. The, uh, one, one day, oh, we had been somewhere that evening, and Uncle was standing there taking off his jacket in front of his closet, and he went like this, and he fell down, and he died, had a heart attack, and passed away. And I was so scared. This was January 20th. He was buried on my birthday, which was January 24th, 1944. So the resistance came to Aunt and said, you know, you can't run the farm anymore. So they have this hierarchy, and nephew and his wife were coming, and they would run the farm. And she said, no, I'm keeping those children. And if their parents return, I will return them to their parents. If not, I will raise them as my own. So we stayed. And one Sunday, we went to visit uh, Tiny, or Aunt's sister, widowed sister on another farm. And when we got there, my sister and I were so happy. Who was hiding there but my Jewish kindergarten teacher and her husband from my hometown? Mm -hmm. So we were so excited. So every Sunday after church, we would go, and she was beginning to teach us how to read and write. And one day we didn't go anymore, and I never knew until in the last 10 years or so what happened to them. What happened was someone revealed their hiding place. Because, you know, there were people who would do that. They were paid. They would get food. So people just, somebody told them they were there. So evidently the um, Germans came with a truck, came on the farm, went and searched the whole house. And from what I heard was that they were very polite. They didn't find anybody. Then they went outside and they went exactly to that haystack where they were hiding underneath. So they knew all along. Then they got really nasty, took them, and said to Aunt's sister, we're taking your son. She said, no, this is my farm. The son was about 19, 20. No, you have to take me. It's my, my farm. No, we're taking him. So they took my teacher, her husband, and this young man. And they took him to a town close by where they were going to be processed. Because, you know, records were accurate records were kept by the Nazis through this whole time period. So they took him to this place, and while they were there one night, Dutch Nazis came into this facility, took my teacher, her husband. Now, oh, by the way, the young man got released. He had some contacts, and he was able to leave. So now these Dutch Nazis come in and take my teacher, her husband, and four other men, walk them to a park nearby, gave them shovels, and had them dig their graves. As soon as they were done, they shot them all, covered it up. So the next day, they're looking, where are these people? They were going to be transported to one of the transit camps. They couldn't find them. So eventually they found out what happened. They made those Dutch Nazis go back to that park, dig up their bodies, put them on the train to the transit camp because now they were accounted for. And these things were so common of what was happening. The, um, there is actually, I've, I've gone to that park and there is a memorial stone there for, for the six of them. Another time we were, after Uncle had died, my sister and I and, and Tony were in one of the rooms and all of a sudden some people barged in and they said, you're leaving right now. And, they just took us, put us on the back of their bicycles. What happened, 
there were, you know, many people who would reveal where Jews were hiding for whatever benefit they could gather from it. But there's also people who overheard some of this. So there were also good people who then would go and warn the people, like, hey, they're coming. They know you're hiding Jews. Do something. So evidently, someone had revealed who we were. We were two Jewish girls being hidden there. And they were going to come and get us. So, but a warning had come out, so they knew. So they took my sister and I on the back of their bicycles. It's now went into hiding in the summer of 1942. It's now right after Christmas, 1944. And I remember spending the night in a safe house, I guess. All I remember is it had rhododendron bushes in front. I'm still looking for this house. But we spent the night there. I don't know who lived there. And the next day, they took us to another family. And this time, we ended up in a little, very historic, little fishing village uh, with another family. And um, they had a daughter, Yo, who was at that time also about 18, 19 years old. And it was a very, very difficult time. The war was winding down because we had the invasion in Normandy Beach in June of 1944. And eventually, as the troops started to move, the southern part of the Netherlands had already been freed. We were north of all the rivers where there was a lot of fighting between the Germans and the Allies. We were north. So we were in this village. No food. This was the hunger winter of the Netherlands. More than 20,000 people died from starvation. There was nothing to eat. The Germans thought the best way was to just starve us out, the population. Very, very difficult. The saving grace was that these were fishermen. And if you look at a very old map of the Netherlands, it was like a huge inlet. It was actually called the South Sea. And the Dutch are very inventive. They like to reclaim land. They had built a, a dam across from one province to the other, closed it off, it became a lake. But the war broke out, and they never had the opportunity to reclaim the land. And many of the fish died because all the rivers were emptying into it and the salt water started to change to fresh water. But there was one fish that survived and continued to multiply. Any idea what the fish could have been? Oh, I love it when I have, you know, fourth and fifth graders. They come up with everything under the sun that wouldn't even live in that climate. But um, it was eel. So every day they went out and they caught eel. And they cooked it for lunch, for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. And they even rendered all the fat and made soap out of it. I mean, you reeked like you were like a walking fish. And nobody was going to school anymore now because there was no wood to heat the classrooms. We, um, and so we were left on our own devices. And we blended in pretty well now because we spoke the dialect and, um, I didn't know, uh, and I've taken teachers there, and we were there, and one of the teachers one time asked, because the daughter of this family just passed away last year, but um, when she was still alive, I would bring my roots, and somebody said, asked me, what was your name when you were in the fishing village? I, I don't know, and she said, oh, your name was Marie Hohendorn. And I said, how, how did you come up with that name? And they had relatives by that name, and they thought it would be easy to remember because we, again, were relatives that were bombed out and now living with them. But it was, it, it was a very difficult time. So people started eating Dutch bulbs, tulip bulbs. I said, don't eat that, it's toxic, you're gonna die. But you know what, nobody died. So they had all these recipes for bulbs, any bulb that we would cook and mush and, and eat. And I remember we would, uh, with some of the other kids there, we would go and try to catch little fish and make a little fire and put a little stick through it and barbecue it to eat. Or we loved finding big bugs with big bodies that we could pull the legs off and put it, stick through it and roast it and eat it. We were so hungry. There was nothing to eat other than eel. So it was a very, very difficult time for us. They. Um, then they said, they broke through. The, the northern part of the Netherlands is going to be free. And everybody was so excited. Now, it was very difficult. There was a curfew in this little town. And you had to better be in when you're supposed to be in. Of course, there were 
no radios, but people did. You, there's ways of making little radios, and they would listen to England, uh, to, to the radio broadcasts. But and there were no newspapers; just placards were put on the walls, and it was all propaganda of how wonderful they were. Um, but nobody believed it. Of course, we weren't. <laughs> we were living horribly, but it just life became so so difficult. And at night, the Germans used to patrol the streets in this little village. And you weren't allowed to have any light. And that was mainly because of the bombing raids of the Allied. They could look down and see light. It isn't like it is now with all the technology. So you had to have all the curtains closed. If they saw a little sliver of light coming through one of the curtains, they'd come in and confiscate your candles. So it was, it was very, and I remember one day they, this family asked my sister and I to go to a neighboring farm. And I guess they thought two little girls would probably get some eggs, maybe beg. And I remember walking out of the village and around this now lake, the dike all around, and on the other side were all meadows, and we were just walking, and all of a sudden there was an air raid, and the bombers, allied planes were coming in to bomb where we were heading. And I just got so scared that I grabbed my sister, we laid down by the side of the dike until this whole bombardment thing was over. And I remember my sister, she suddenly gets up, she saw a cornflower, she wanted to pick a flower. No, you can't. And when it was over, we retreated back into the village. Of course, got no eggs, got nothing, no food. But it was, uh, of course, the Germans had these little planes they used to just go up and try to shoot everything out of the sky, but also took great pleasure in just picking people off the street to swoop down and just shoot them off their bicycles or whatever. So you had to be very, very, very careful. The same thing as planes were crashing all around us. Um, pieces, I remember one time, I mean, pieces were falling out of the sky. You had to be very careful uh, and try to find cover because just the smallest piece falling down could kill you. Um, I remember having to go into the meadows because the allies threw out, it was like tinsel. They threw that out of their planes through the whole area in the meadows and it was to mess up the German radar. But we had animals, so we had to always go out there. And, but we had no choice. We were able to collect it and make like a ball out of it. And I remember one time on the farm one evening, because everything that was raised, they had a couple of pigs. And the Germans say, oh, pig's fat enough. We're taking it. So secretly, one night, they slaughtered a pig. I'll always remember this. And very quietly, and they had it on the ladder. And my sister and I were so excited because there was one part of that pig we wanted. This was going to be a toy for us because we didn't have anything. Any idea what it could have been? No? No. It was the bladder because we could dry it and then blow it up and we had a ball to play with. I mean, look at all the toys and things that are around you now. That's what we played with. I also collected ammunition. It was like all over the place, you know, here, there, everywhere. And I had a secret shelf in one of the barns, and I put it all there, and I played with all this stuff I found. Nobody supervised me, no idea what I had. But um, so they said, we're going to be free. The, the, the Allied forces have broken through. And sure enough, a couple, you know, I don't remember. All I remember was April 19th, 1945, they said, they are advancing the Allied troops. They've already freed the village before us, and they're coming on this deck around the lake, not the highway. And everybody got so excited. All the German soldiers left the village, and we're all putting out our flag, anything orange, because the royal family was the House of Orange. It's like a national color. So excited. We were all celebrating, and the German soldiers came back, and they were not happy to see. So there was a lot of shooting, and it was horrible. And then they left again, so people went out and retrieved their dead and wounded and dragged everybody in their houses, and we waited. And the place where we were living was on the second floor, and I could look out the window, and I could see where they told me the tanks were going to come in. And all of a sudden, a truck pulled in with men in blue coveralls. No clue who they were. I found out years later these were Dutch resistance fighters who were attached to the Allied forces. And since they, well, they had spies, they knew the village was safe, they gave them the honor, honor of coming in first into the village. 
right behind that came the Canadians. We were freed mostly in the Netherlands by Canadian soldiers with their tanks. And that to me, even now, so many years later, it's still very um, touching to me. That particular day when those tanks rolled in and everybody came out and just, and I'm sure you've seen pictures everywhere. He's climbing all over the tanks. And, and you know, the daughter of the second family years later told me the story, I don't remember, but she said, um, one of the uh, one of the Canadian soldiers offered me a chocolate bar. Um, what was my mom not taking this? So he unwrapped it. I still didn't know what is this brown thing. So she said, she told me she said I knew what it was. So she said she broke off a piece and just shoved it in my mouth. And that's why the title of my book is Chocolate: The Taste of Freedom, because that was the first thing I tasted that day was a piece of chocolate. So now they decided that we should go back to go to, to Tani, our aunt, on the farm to wait and see if my parents survived. There had been no contact. Uh, so we went back to the farm and we found out my parents were alive. They survived. Now when my sister and I left that day, that very first evening, Christian friends are there snuck in the house. And my mother told me she was, we, we didn't have central heat. It was one of those cold things. She was burning every, all the papers, you know, birth certificate, everything. And these friends snuck in and said, well, where are the girls? They explained. And they said, well, where are you going to go? And they said, we have no place to go. And as I said earlier, everyone was registered. They knew who you were and where you lived. And if you weren't at that train station, your name wasn't checked off, they were going to come and find you. So they said, come stay with us. And they lived just outside the town, and they had a uh, car dealership. They had like this showroom in the front, the service area in the back, and they lived in the apartment above it. There's only one problem, they said. There's two German officers, because our whole town was occupied by German soldiers, two officers living in one of our bedrooms. But they, so my parents agreed to go and live with them. My parents lived in their attic for three years. They could come out in the house when these soldiers were not there. My mother told me one incident, uh, there was a bombing, and everybody was like, they had been in the attic, and everybody, you know, she said, and fortunately, the German soldiers never realized, instead of two people, there were an extra two people. But um, my father could never, never go outside, because it's his hometown, he would be recognized. Second of all, there were no Dutch men, Christian or Jew, out on the street because the Germans were grabbing them to use them as slave labor in Germany. So he could never go outside. My mother said that she would dress as a nurse and try to get, beg for food for them and also deliver some messages for the resistance. But they were told their daughters are still alive. Now as the Germans retreated, they blew up all the bridges and the Netherlands has a lot of waterways and there was no cars. The only thing that moved into the country were trucks with food, because we were all suffering from malnutrition. So somehow my parents were able to hitchhike and came on the farm. And I remember that day, they, and I don't know exactly what day it was, but we had one room and had a door to the outside and a door to the inside, and there was a pump there, the water pump. And I remember standing on the inside door, my sister and I were, behind Tiny, because she had, you know, the wooden shoes, the whole traditional costume. And there was this man and woman standing in the doorway. I had no clue who they were. So I remember her giving me a shove. I was on her right side saying, this is your mom and your dad. Would you shake their hand? And I kind of went forward and shook their hand and hit back again. So they realized that we didn't know who they were, and we weren't going to go home with them. So they decided to stay on the farm for a little bit so that we could get used to them. And I remember taking my father to the barn where I had the secret shelf of my little ammunition. Well, I thought the poor man was going to have a heart attack because I, had, I was playing with live grenades. Most of it was not spent ammunition. And many, many of my little friends during the war were injured. Finding all this stuff around, it is exploding. Um, of course, I don't know what he did with it, but I never saw it again. It was gone. Um, so then I decided, I'm now nine and a half years old, and I said, okay, 
we'll go home with you, but if we don't like you, we're coming back and staying with Aunt. So um, we went home, went to our house that had been bombed. And you saw the house, but now it's all fixed. A bomb had fallen in the backyard because it was near the train station and there was a lot of bombing there. And we had nothing, nothing. All we had were the clothes on our backs. Um, the house, there was no wood in the house. First of all, nobody had window panes because it was bombing and all it was gone. But people, since the house was abandoned, they came in in the winter and took all the wooden doors, the wood, any, anything wood in the house were taken because people needed it for firewood. So when you walked in, there was a front door, but you walked in, you fell into sand because the floors were gone. Everything was gone. And we lived upstairs in one of the bedrooms and it was all with, um, boarded up with just a little piece of glass in it. And the Canadians had set up a soup kitchen kitchen at the beginning of our street. They gave my mother a pot, four bowls, four spoons, and three times a day she walked up there and got food for us. It was always something liquid. And that's how we had to start. Um, my parents said, well, where's, where's the rest of our family? People started to come back from the camps. And oh, hearing these horrific stories of what had happened. I remember the day my mother received a letter from the Dutch Red Cross and it informed her that they had all perished. My German grandparents, my father's sister, her husband, and my three little cousins, my Dutch grandmother and my Dutch grandfather. My Dutch grandmother was in the hospital just before we went into hiding. She had had a heart attack and so now they were called to go to Amsterdam and my Grandfather, I found out later, asked if he could have an ambulance instead of taking, he couldn't take her on the train. So she was taken to Amsterdam and she died in Amsterdam just before they were all sent to Vesterborg. And in the beginning I told you all those Jewish refugees who arrived who had no place, they had built this camp for them. So when we were invaded, they said, oh, we have all these people right here. They put a fence, the Nazi Germans put a fence around it and it became a huge transit camp in the Netherlands. Most, there were about three or four, but this was the biggest. And my family went there too. They were, when um, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, and my German grandparents went by train. They were put on a train to Amsterdam into a ghetto, which was open, not like the ghettos you know. And they were then taken to this theater, as a matter of fact, because I went to stop at this theater with my group and had all the names saw my family name, so I knew they had been there, and they ended up at this transit camp and were taken to Sobibor, which was a, a death camp in Poland, and they all all perished there the same day they arrived. I've actually, th there's been a lot of research, many records are being found now, um, and that my Dutch grandfather actually, the day he arrived, every once a week a train would go to the concentration camps from this transit camp, Westerbord. The day he arrived was the day of a train and they threw him right on the train and two days later he was he was gassed at Sobe Board, so okay, I'm gonna catch my breath. Any questions? No questions? Yes. My sister is still alive, yeah. She lives in South Carolina, but she really I was her protector, you know. She just remembers all the bad things uh, that happened to us and there were some horrific things that we experienced but I don't like to talk about it I really like to share my story in a positive way how people cared and it didn't matter especially in today's world because genocides are continuing this very minute and it's just that people cared so much and risked their lives it didn't matter to them that we were Jews and they were Christians we were human beings so I, I rather dwell on that of how people really care, especially to our young kids, to tell them how people care and how they must care for each other. Any other questions? I have, how am I doing time-wise? Good? Because uh, the pictures. Sure. All right. What are I push? not the red one? No, right one. Right or left? Okay. I'm not, not a techie. 
This is a picture of uh, Europe. And you see there's 140,000 Jews living in the Netherlands. 75% of our Jewish population perished, the highest in all of Western Europe by the numbers. This is me. Um, this is before the war. This is a picture of my family, my mother, father, my sister and I. I'm the one with the cute hairdo. <laughs> This must have been taken, I'd probably say, maybe in 41. It, just, it was before we went into hiding. This is a positive picture of my immediate family who perished. To the left on the top are my Dutch grandfather and my Dutch grandmother, who, by the way, somebody found a cemetery. She is buried in the Netherlands because she died in Amsterdam. She's buried in a Jewish cemetery right outside of Amsterdam. To the right are my mother's parents. Below is my father's sister, her husband, and my three little cousins. That's the age they were when they all perished. They were about the same age as my sister and I. This is my train station, the way it looked, well, right after. This, I think I took this picture in probably in the 50s or 60s. It doesn't look like that, but you can tell by the cars. And that roof on the left there was the restaurant, and the kiosk was right down there. But the next picture will show you, there's the restaurant. That evidently is a later picture because the cars have changed. <coughs> this, remember I said when we couldn't go to school anymore, this is a, a classroom of kids, uh, all Jewish children, who with the Jewish teachers tried to continue our education as best as they could. That's my sister and I. And this little boy up there, where the teacher has her hand in front, I just made contact with him again. He and his brother survived. Only the four of us out of, about well, three of us out of this particular picture survived. The rest were all murdered. But I, he doesn't look like that anymore now. It's been 70 some odd years. <laughs> but it was interesting how you make these connections again so many years later. And my mother had to buy this. She had to pay one guilder, which was a Dutch currency, for each star. And then she had to cut them out and sew them on our clothing. Well, these are all, I don't even know where this picture came from, but it's a picture from uh, Dutch children. This is, the only thing is wrong, it should say the Netherlands, not Holland. This was the Jewish, the area in Amsterdam where most of the Jews lived. This was in May of 1941. This was the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam where they threw everybody into, you know, into one room, you know, five families in one little apartment. And on the top in German it says Jewish quarter, underneath it's in Dutch, Jewish quarter. There, there was not, it was not gated like they were in Poland. This again is there, but you can see the stores being shuttered up. This was one of the transit camps, and you can see people are just being held there, again with all the barbed wire. And the Germans did not like the names of our streets, because they were Dutch names. So they took them all down and changed everything to German, just like Auschwitz was Auschwitzian. They changed all the camps to German, in Poland, to German names also. I have a yeah. Um, after the war, did they change the names back? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. The yes. Yes. These are people, they got off the trolley, and they're on their way to be deported. This was one of the cattle cars at this transit camp that left every week. And you see, mostly, it's mostly women and children on this particular train. That's Anne Frank. You all know her. That's Anne Frank again. Tiny took my sister and I to a photographer during the war. And she dressed us up again because we were wearing, you know, wooden shoes and everything. She, she put back on the clothes we arrived in, so they're kind of tight. And I had braids. But I kept losing my braids because we slept on um, straw mattresses and they contain lice. 
my hair was constantly, as long as it got like that, it was cut off again because the lice invaded. And this, there's a picture that same, that same day with, with Tani. This was uncle. And this was Tani's brother, who so I said he couldn't hear. That was a hearing aid in the 40s. You had to shout into this thing and hope he, you know, could understand you. This is a picture I found in a, in a book, and my sister and I are on that picture. This was during a war. This was the farmhouse, the way it looks now, where we were hidden. And that green building on the left was where he made wooden shoes, and behind that is that barn where the young boy was hiding underneath. Somebody during a war, I, must, um, I know it was because from what it says, somebody I remember gave me a piece of paper. I didn't know how to read or write. And, and it was something in pencil. And they gave me a pen and a pot of ink and had me trace all the letters. And then when it was dry, they erased the pencil. And it was a note to my parents. And it says, Dear Mommy and Daddy, we like it here very much. We want to be free. And we'd very much like to see you again when we come back. Um, I'm helping Aunt Tani milk the cows. I want to become a farmer school. I don't know what happened to that. And the teacher is giving us lessons, that teacher. And then it said that Uncle had died. And then on the bottom it says, Goodbye, so long, Margie and Rika Spronk. Somehow my mother got that. And it's now in a museum in Washington, D.C., somewhere. But she saved it, and of course I didn't know what I was copying, and I never saw it until my mother showed it to me. These were huts in the woods near where we were, where many Jews were being hidden. This is the house in a little fishing village. We were on the second floor, and here you can see I marked that window on the left to where I could see the tanks came in. This, well, there's also a, a PBS documentary. It's online. It's called The Hidden Child. And PBS and JN at the time filmed it. And this is Yo, the daughter of the second family, and her husband. This is the place that was already boarded up where my parents were hidden. It's now been destroyed. It's gone. And that's the attic where my parents hid. But of course, it didn't have those nice sliding doors or anything. This is another, this is a, one of the transit camps called Furcht. It's a picture of my sister and I after the war studying. A picture of me now and then. And this is Henry Fond signing a book for me. I work, I'm the one on the right. I work for Pan American. And this is a picture of my husband and I. And that's it. Her memoir, as you heard, Chocolate, The Taste of Freedom, um, we do have some copies. It, its price is $19.95, but if anybody is interested, $15. And all the proceeds, by the way, go to Stockton University. Because they're the ones who helped me write right. the book. Right. So, so, uh, so if anybody is interested, we have some copies. And also, more will sign it for you. But, uh, and there's way more to her life. <laughs> Uh, I, I, mean, I left the Netherlands and came to New York, as you can see, she wound up working for Pan American, so, and she's been doing all this fabulous Holocaust education work. For and I learned English in the movie theater, because <laughs> there was no bilingual education oh, in the very first summer, because it's very warm here. We were dying of all this humidity, and so for a quarter you'd go to the movies and they would show a cartoon, a newsreel, a feature film, and then it would start all over again. You could sit there all day. So that's what we did. And I was, I was 14 years old when I came here. I was put in the fourth grade because I couldn't speak the language. And uh, the time I came back in the fall, uh, in September, because you all had like off here forever in the summer, we, uh, they put me in, I was in the fifth grade. Then they were able to test me. I went to the seventh grade in September. And then I went to the eighth grade. And in January, I was in high school because in Holland, the six years elementary, and then you go to a high school. And I had learned, evidently, I learned as much in, not that I did go the whole six years because of the war, but 
in six years of what you all learned here in eight. So I ended up graduating more or less with students my own age almost. So. I want to thank everybody for coming. Let's give a round of applause.